Well, good evening, everybody. I think we should start. My name is Dennis Galligan, Professor of Sociolegal Studies at Oxford, and formerly 11 years visiting professor here at the CEU until I retired from that position some years ago. So it's, for me, a great privilege and pleasure to come back to the CEU after some years of absence. This uh, lecture, followed by tomorrow's workshop, is an opportunity to review, at least begin a review, of 20 years or so of constitutional change. Change in ideas of constitutions and change in constitutions, not least the very contemporary change that's going on around us now. So we thought, as part of a program called the Social and Political Foundations of Constitutions, which colleagues and I have been working on and developing for the last two years or so, we thought it a very sensible and appropriate part of that program to take another look at constitutions and constitutional ideas in this part of the region. So tomorrow, just for those of you who haven't seen, there, is a, there are programs available up there for the workshop on constitutions and constitutionalism in Central and East Europe. And we have four papers, all dealing with different themes and aspects of the last 20 years of constitutional change and development. But tonight, and I should just say that you are very welcome to come along tomorrow, the, the seminar will be here in the CEU, and uh, you're most welcome to come starting at 9.30. But tonight, we're launching the program with a lecture by a very well-known figure in this part of the world who hardly needs any introduction from me, but nevertheless, he's going to get one. So Professor Janos Kies is, is um, uh, a very uh, outstanding academic, uh, a major figure politically and culturally, not just in Hungary, but in the much broader European context and beyond. Professor Kish is Professor of Political Science. Sorry, oh, I don't think I've got that right. He's Professor of Political Science and Philosophy here at the CEU, just to be accurate. But he's held many positions at other universities in both France and the United States, including currently at NYU Law School, where he's in the company of other well-known philosophers like Nagel and Dworkin. So uh, Professor Kish has also uh, written extensively for the last 30, 35 years, written extensively about issues ranging across a wide spectrum, and I won't begin to summarize that spectrum, except perhaps to point out two more recent publications, one on constitutional democracy, which, which shows Professor Keisha's deep interest in this issue, and his most recent book, Politics as a Moral Problem, published in 2009. So it's with great pleasure that I, and honor really, a great privilege to have Professor Keish give this lecture tonight. He'll talk for about 50 minutes or so, and then we'll have a 15, 20 minutes period for discussion and some questions. And then after that, we'll reward ourselves with a drink outside. So welcome again, and very welcome to Professor Keish. Over to you. Introduction. Uh, now, uh, and thank you all for coming to listen to this talk. Now, uh, those who are Hungarians or are at least residents here at the CEU uh, know very well that Hungary is currently undergoing a genuine constitutional crisis, which is called constitution making. Now, uh, my aim with this talk is not uh, to uh, focus in particular on that crisis. Uh, what I hope to be able to tell you is going to serve rather as a background, as an explanatory background which helps better to understand what is going on now, although I will 
make some remarks towards the end on this. So my talk will deal with problems of constitution making in a particular type of context, that of negotiated transitions, negotiated transitions to democracy. I will argue that negotiated transitions are a natural home uh, for what I call in the title of my talk a two-stage constitution making process. Can you hear me well like this? Okay, I will avoid that. The stage one involves the making of interim constitutional arrangements for the transition period. And then the final constitution is supposed to be adopted after the transition is completed, after the first, some time after the first three elections. Now, from this perspective, the Hungarian constitution making process up until this year seems to be incomplete, right? We had the transition constitution making. We had a failed attempt at finalizing the transition constitution between 1995 and 1998. And since then, there was not even an attempt at doing that job. Now, interestingly, the constitutional court of this country, right from the beginning and right from 1990, uh, made its uh, constitutional interpretations as if the transition constitution were the final constitution. In uh, the obvious hope that uh, in the end, uh, the constitution without a second constitution making uh, will obtain the pedigree of a final constitution by practice, by getting accepted in practice. And for a certain time, actually up until last year, it looked as though not only the court, but the other branches of government, including the parliament and the parties uh, running for parliamentary mandates, uh, came to agree uh, with the Constitutional Court on this. Now that quasi-consensus came to an end with the, 19, uh, with the 210 elections when the right won a constitution-making majority. This is uh, the general background of my talk. So I will proceed in the following way. First, I will say something on negotiated transitions as a special case of momentous systemic change. Then I turn to the phenomenon of two-stage constitution making, why negotiated transitions involve such a thing. Third, I will address the question why the true stage process remained incomplete in Hungary, as I will try to show you that, on the face of it, that's a paradox. And finally, I will make brief remarks on the consequences of the incompleteness of the Hungarian process. So let me begin by uh, negotiated transitions. Now, as we all know very well, the transitions of 1989 opened the way towards tectonic changes in the political and economic systems of uh, the countries of the former Soviet Union and former Soviet bloc. First, the party state gave way to multi-party representative democracy, the rule of law, human rights, separation of powers. And second, the command economy was dismantled, foundations for a market economy based on the primacy of private property were being led down. Now, focusing on the outcome of the transition process, we can say that it was truly 
revolutionary. No major revolution in history accomplished as much in such a, or more, at least more, but perhaps not even as much in such a short time. But a revolution is more than changes with momentous outcomes. A revolution is also a mode of the change. When we speak about the revolution, we also say something about the character of the process. For example, we have in mind people storming the Bastille or the Red Guards storming uh, the Winter Palace while Aurora shuts over the palace <laughs> into the city and so on and so forth. So the question is how to characterize processes that are revolutionary not just in their outcomes but also in their mode, modality as well. Now, when we think about storming the Bastille, for example, we have a large number of people in front of us uh, breaking the law and we have the state losing the capacity to enforce the law against the lawbreakers. lawbreakers. So perhaps uh, we could see the relevant property of revolutions along the dimension of legality. And perhaps what we should do is to continue a little bit and move from, I don't know what was the name of Las Bastille, at the time the Bastille was still there, now it is Place Bastille, the Bastille is not there anymore, there is the Opera Bastille instead. But in any case, uh, we move from the Place Bastille to Versailles, Jeu de Pomme. Now as uh, you all remember, as I do from uh, high school studies, what happened uh, before the Paris uprising was that the king called together their state general. But in reaction to what happened in Paris and in reaction to other events in the country, the estates general decided to challenge the king. Uh, the, the rule for the estates general was that they had to sit by estates and to vote by estates. Okay. So at the Jeu de Pomme, the deputies uh, vowed, took the oath that from now on they will not be a state general, they will be a national assembly and they merge. Now that was an act of breaking legality because only the king could have given them the power to do so. But that was of course done in violation of the king's will. So perhaps we can say there is revolution, legally speaking, when legal continuity is broken. Uh, legal continuity is upheld, on the other hand, when all the relevant legal changes proceed in accordance with the amendment rules or legislative rules and or legislative rules of the previous regime. So that officials who came into office according to the succession rules of the old regime, estates general called together by the king, do what they are permitted to do by the rules of the previous regime make petitions to the king, then get legislative proposals from the king, vote on those proposals, estate by estate, and then combine the results. Okay. So it seems that if we focus on the dimension of the law, then these two possibilities are mutually exclusive and they jointly exhaust the uh, universe of the possibilities. So we can say perhaps that 
there is a revolution in the legal sense when legal continuity is broken, and there is just reform, perhaps large-scale reform, perhaps a reform as momentous as a revolution would be, when the changes are implemented uh, in a seamless continuation of the legal tradition. The content of the law is being changed, perhaps very radically, but the process respects the rules of amendment each step. Perhaps the rules of amendment can also be changed in accordance with the previous rule of amendment. Okay. So uh, that could be uh, uh, an option. And then if we consider the cases of transitions in Eastern Europe, we will find that except for Romania, in all the former dependencies of the Soviet Union, a kind of process went on which uh, satisfied the conditions of legal reform if you identify legal reform with legal continuity. There is a problem though, namely that uh, if this is how, if, if this is a, a sufficient and satisfactory characterization of the transition process, then we have a story which in this country was cherished by the post-communists, but nobody else, not even the liberals who for uh, more than a decade altogether were uh, coalition partners of the socialists, were willing to accept. This country experienced significant in comparison to other East European countries, significant reforms, mainly economic, but not only economic reforms, since the 1960s, since 1968, that was the first big package. And then there was another big package in the mid-80s. Now, in uh, the post-communist narrative of the transition, the transition was just a continuation and accomplishment of a process which was started already, which was being started already before the regime change. And that is somehow embarrassing, uh, not just because, because uh, we uh, don't want to see the transition to be just uh, uh, the act of uh, the ex-communists in power, but, uh, but also because uh, it, independently of our desires and wishes, there are here facts which do not very well fit this story. So we have to identify those facts. Now, if we consider for a moment Czechoslovakia or the GDR, it will be easy to find those Facts. In both, both in Czechoslovakia and in GDR, actually, there were roundtable negotiations as there were roundtable negotiations in Hungary and in Poland. But those negotiations came exposed after the breakdown of the regime. There were continuous day by day demonstrations. Perhaps that the example of which was set in Leipzig and then spread uh, through Germany and uh, then Czechoslovakia, perhaps that set the stage for more recent revolutions of this kind, like that in, in Egypt more recently and Tunisia uh, earlier. That peaceful demonstrations and nothing else make the regime break down. Now what happened in, in Czechoslovakia and in Germany was that then after they have practical, for all practical intents and purposes, lost their power, after they have lost the capacity to mobilize their power against the people, the power holders called for negotiations to embellish surrendering. So that was one story. So we can then, uh, if we focus on Czechoslovakia and, and the GDR, we would say that actually, there was social revolution, there was 
it is true that somehow the power holders succeeded to make the process legally continuous. But the legally continuous process was combined with a genuine social revolution, right? It just gave legal form to it. The roundtable talks allowed uh, the old parliaments to continue to issue laws, to set the stage for free elections and so on and so forth. But that was not the case in Hungary or in Poland. There were uh, significant uh, political events, of course, with, uh, uh, beyond the control of the power holders, but uh, the power did not break down in Poland or in Hungary when it came to negotiations. Actually, the Polish story is uh, uh, the most telling one of, of, of all the uh, transition stories because what happened in Poland was uh, that by the end of 1988, the weakening of both sides, both the Communist Party in government and Solidarność came uh, to the surface, became uh, publicly to the sea. The weakening of, of uh, the party state was demonstrated by the failed referendum in 1987. Jaruzelski wanted a referendum on his reform proposals and he failed the referendum. Uh, the people voted against reforms not because the, those reforms didn't make sense, but because they wanted to vote against Jaruzelski and his company. Now, one year later, Solidarność announced a general strike, which was quite a success in regional comparisons, but a failure in, as compared to the general strike in 1980. So the communist power holders then came to the idea that this is the time when they may ask Solidarność to engage in negotiations with them. Uh, what they were terribly afraid was the next elections to sign. If Solidarność calls for a boycott to the elections, that is the end of the legitimacy of the regime. So they wanted Solidarność not to boycott the next election. So they made a proposal, and that was the way the, uh, the negotiations started. They made a proposal, we re-legalize you, and you agree to run for uh, the parliament uh, on, uh, on, on a formula of semi-free elections. 35% uh, of the seats are free, and the rest are reserved for the Communist Party, and it's satellite. That was the offer, which then led to a more uh, significant change. Uh, the, as it is well known, in this form, uh, Solidarność did not accept the offer, and then the communists proposed to create a Senate uh, with completely free uh, election for the Senate seat. And, and then it came to the elections, which resulted in, in uh, an electoral, uh, in a complete defeat uh, for the communists. But in any case, in any case, uh, one can't say that in Poland the <coughs> government uh, broke down as a result of a mass movement on the street and, the, uh, uh, and it, it just surrendered arms. And that was not the case in Hungary either. So we need something else to explain what uh, the specificity of what happened. We can't say that, that uh, there was legal reform combined with social revolution. There was no social revolution in this sense. No. But perhaps there is something else which is common in, in uh, the case of Poland, Hungary on the one hand, and Czechoslovakia and GDR on the other. And that, I would say, is the, the 
progressive erosion of legitimacy of the previous regime, which then led to a format of change where the establishment of the new regime, con continuous or not, legally speaking, completed the, le the delegitimization of the previous one. When you have just wholesale reforms, uh, the change may be significant, but the pre-reform state and the post-reform state uh, can be jointly legitimate, right? The, post, the reforms uh, con uh, contribute to legitimize ex post the pre-reform state, but the transitions which went on in 1989 in this region, even in Poland and in Hungary, ended up in creating a regime which can be jointly legitimate with the pre transition regime. If this one is legitimate, that was not, and vice versa. So I would want them to say that, that we have two variables, not one, legality and legitimacy. And we can then say that revolutions break both legality, legal continuity, and continuity in legitimacy. That wholesale reforms preserve both legality and legitimacy. Then there is a case, break in legality and continuity of legitimacy, foreign occupation, for example, when after the occupation comes to an end, uh, the continuity with the previous uh, regime is restored, that that was, that was the, the Hungarian nobility's position in the 1860s after the defeat of the 1848 revolution. They said that we have to negotiate with the king on the basis of the continuity of the 84, uh, 48 law, April laws, pagged in the terminology of a historical constitution, those who are Hungarian in this room will understand the allusion. Now, and finally, there is a case where legal continuity is upheld, but there is a break in legitimacy. And I want to say that what happened in 89 uh, uh, in Eastern Europe belongs to this category. Now, why negotiations at all? Uh, uh, it is precisely the erosion of legitimacy which, which uh, brings the power holders to the negotiating table. Uh, they agree that uh, in order to save some of their powers, uh, they need to institute significant political and other reforms, but they also see that they have no authority anymore to make sure that if they announce a process of reforms, their scenario will define the only game in town. They cannot make sure to control the process what start, once started. In order to make that sure, they need to enlarge the basis of the regime. They need to enlarge the basis of the regime, and uh, uh, they need to talk to those who, if they are not involved in an agreement uh, uh, for a transition to they don't know yet, exactly where, if they are not involved in an agreement in a transition, might uh, become the leaders of the forces of disruption of the process. So uh, negotiations 
uh, uh, both in Poland and in Hungary were needed because the power holders had not the authority necessary to uh, accomplish the transition by themselves alone anymore. Now, this leads us to our second topic, the two-stage constitution-making process. Uh, at the negotiation table, uh, the parties uh, had to agree on two things. First, where the process should lead, and second, what the rules of transition should be. Okay. So they had to lay down rules for a transition to whatever uh, outcome they agree on. Now, as I told you, in Poland, the original agreement was about something like a, a, an authoritarian regime with limited parliamentary pluralism, and, uh, but also freedom of association and expression and other freedoms included, with the abstract possibility on the horizon that uh, at some point in time, uh, uh, limited pluralism may be transformed into genuine uh, pluralism. Now, it is clear that the Polish roundtable could not agree on a final democratic constitution because uh, the design they agreed upon was not a democracy yet, right? So we can see why the Polish story involved a two-stage process. Already the agreement struck at the roundtable discussions uh, near Warsaw and then passed into law by the last communist parliament was of a constitutional character. It changed the constitutional character of the regime and it changed the constitutional character of the regime more in a more momentous way than anybody could foresee at the time the agreement was struck. I don't believe the communist side would have engaged in that particular deal if they had foreseen the outcome. The outcome was this. In Poland, unlike in Hungary, Hungary was a genuine one-party regime. Poland was a, a veiled one-party regime. Uh, the Communist Party ran for uh, the same on a single list with two satellites, the Democratic Party and uh, the People's Party, uh, which, uh, as long as the old regime held, were faithful companion uh, in arms or design of uh, the communists. But what happened was that when Solidarność won 99 seats of the 100 seats in the Senate, and the one single seat didn't go to the communists, it went to an independent. Okay. Then the satellites suddenly defected. And as it turned out, the communists didn't have the majority to form a government. Okay. And then immediately, that was a different regime, and they found themselves in opposition in the same way as those communist parties which did not try to uh, uh, to get constitutional safeguards for the majority. Okay. Now, so perhaps uh, the reason why uh, the constitution of Poland uh, was made, of the democratic Poland was made not in one step, but to actually three. In 1992, uh, they made uh, that's something they called 
the small constitution about the basic design, constitutional design of the country, and then the final constitution was adopted in 1997 only. But, uh, but the reason seems to be that, that uh, the outcome of the negotiations was not what at least one of the two sides uh, could accept as a final constitution. But it was already a kind of constitution making. Now, Hungary was different. The stakes uh, were raised very high in the case of uh, uh, Hungary when it came to the negotiations for two reasons. Uh, one reason was that Hungary was not the first one. There was already the Polish agreement when the negotiations started in Hungary. So the baseline was set already. It was clear that the Hungarian communists can, could not offer less than the Polish communists agreed to give. As a consequence, the other side could ask for more. But there was another ironic reason why in Hungary uh, the Polish deal uh, became unacceptable. And that reason is uh, that the Hungarian opposition was much weaker than the Polish one. Now, how, how come, you might uh, uh, ask me, how is it possible that a weaker opposition asks for more and gets more? Now, the answer is this, that the, the deal which Solidarność struck with the communists was such that everybody was very uncomfortable with. And, but the Solidarność was a, a, a mass movement. Even, even uh, in those times, it had hundreds of thousands of members. It didn't have 10 million members anymore, but there were some hundreds of thousands of fee-paying members of Solidarność. And it had leaders uh, with a great political experience who have been known for their integrity and capacity to resist to pressure. So they could go to their people and tell them, look, we know that this is a compromise. This is not what we want to have. But believe us, this is the most we could ask for at this point, and we will get together more later on. Now, Hungary did not have Solidarność and did not have historical leaders of uh, the authority of Valencia. Okay. So the Hungarian opposition side could not go to the people and tell them, you know us, this was the most we could have. Uh, uh, immediately there would have been the suspicion that you just wanted to get co-opted. And therefore, and therefore, paradoxically, the weak Hungarian opposition had to raise the stake very high. And as it turned out, the Communist Party was not strong enough uh, consistently to resist. And by the end of the negotiations, the constitution, the Hungarian constitution was completely revised. A constitutional justice in 1990 or 1991 uh, said this bon mot, which is repeated too often now. I am repeating it the, uh, n plus one's time now. He said that, uh, that this is, in fact, the 1949 constitution amended but it has only one provision in common with the original. The capital of Hungary is Budapest. Now you are going to have a constitution which has no single provision in common with the original one because this one is left out. I don't exactly know why. <laughs> uh, uh, this is not the biggest problem with <laughs> that constitution. Uh, now, and nevertheless, 
And nevertheless, not for a moment, the opposition side believe that they can agree with the other side on making a constitution such that then the legislature will adopt it as the constitution, the, the permanent constitution of the future republic. Why? That is the question. Not the content. So what's the reason? The reason is uh, popular sovereignty. The idea is that those who give constitution to the people must have the authorization from the people. So the permanent constitution must be given, must be made by elected representatives of the people, elected in free and fair elections. And no matter how significant the constitutional changes, no matter how good this constitution is, as it is now, it can be the final constitution of the country. So that was the view uh, of uh, everybody, including uh, in the opposition round table, that was the name of, of the coalition of the opposition parties in 1989, including the then two liberal parties, Free Democrats and Fidesz, uh, who uh, uh, completely endorsed the constitution insofar as its uh, content was concerned. We agreed that the act in which we participate cannot be giving constitution to the future republic. Now, uh, but then there is the next paradox. If the constitution was so good, why couldn't it be finalized, right? after the regime change, right? Bulgaria had its constitution in 1991, I guess. Slovakia, the Czech Republic in 1992. Uh, Poland in 92 and then 97. And Hungary did not have its final constitution. So that's a, that's a very, and that, that's a puzzle which uh, needs to be answered. Now, to answer that puzzle, we have uh, uh, to answer the question why the uh, constitution making process remained, the Hungarian constitution proce making process remained incomplete. Although there was this constitution which should have been technically uh, revised, structurally revised, but not revised either uh, uh, as to the constitutional design of the republic or as to the provisions for human rights, separation of powers, and, and protection, constitutional protection to human rights, it was, from that point of view, very good. Now, so it provided for a parliamentary system, a government responsible to the legislature, the president elected by the legislature, and having no executive powers, and a unicameral parliament. Now, uh, that structure was not just good, it was in conformity with the progressive democratic tradi uh, constitution traditions of the country, 1848 and then 1946. The problem is that this constitutional design, no, sorry, I start again. There are two problems, but the first problem is that this constitutional design was not being uh, adopted through common deliberation and agreement. It was partly chance, partly political struggle. Uh, the chance part of the story was that uh, the communist constitution provided for a unicameral parliament. It continued the, the 1946 con uh, still democratic uh, small constitution. It was called small constitution again. Uh, 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 
uh, the communists themselves, they wanted a second chamber, uh, uh, not aligned on popular representation, one person, one vote, but on delegation by various kind of corporations, uh, and churches, uh, uh, academy of sciences, uh, uh, trade unions, and uh, what not. It's an interesting story why precisely they wanted this, but they wanted But they didn't raise this issue because they had another one on their heart, and that was uh, the, uh, the powers and the uh, rules uh, of the president and the rules uh, of elections. Uh, of presidential uh, election. So they have set aside this issue for after the transition. And therefore, because the previous uh, constitution provided for a unicameral parliament, and because the new constitution was created by an amendment of the previous one, uh, we don't have a, an upper house, a corporatist upper house. Uh, the president was a different story. The, the communists wanted very much to have a president with executive, some at least executive powers. They wanted a kind of semi-presidential system like they have in France. Not a presidential system, like it's a semi-presidential system like they have in France. Uh, partly because they thought uh, uh, that Hungary for a longer period of time will still remain part of the Soviet sphere of interest and they wanted to make sure that the Soviet interests are well entrenched within Hungarian constitution. They thought they could get the position of the president. They, they thought they could get the position of the president even in free popular elections. So they wanted a president elected by direct popular elections and having uh, ex some executive powers. That was the big stalemate, uh, the negotiations. And then a kind of compromise was made between uh, the Hungarian Democratic Forum and the socialists, or they were not socialists then yet. It was the Socialist Workers' Party. And, and uh, uh, the, the communists to the effect that, well, the, the constitutional design will provide for a president elected by the parliament, but at first, at, on, on one occasion, the president will be elected nevertheless by direct popular vote. Now, uh, the liberals, including your speaker, were adamantly against this solution for two reasons. One was that we didn't want to have a, a communist president before the parliamentary elections for various different reasons, including the biasing, possible biasing of the outcome of the election. But there was a deeper reason. We were convinced that if uh, the president is elected as an exception by direct popular vote, uh, the demand for amending the constitution in this sense will be irresistible and we didn't want to have a semi-presidential system in this country, not because we believed that semi-presidentialism is necessarily bad for uh, all possible uh, democratic societies, but we were convinced that in this region of the world semi-presidential uh, regimes are more likely uh, to be dangerous for democracy then no in any case what happened was that we uh, refrained from blocking the agreement we could have vetoed it but we refrained from that allowed the agreement to be made and then attacked this point in a referendum and the referendum defeated uh, the one time direct parliamentary uh, direct election, presidential elections and left the constitution without it as we have it now uh, uh, but 
there was no agreement, but that again was not a result of an agreement. It was not only the socialists who were against this structure. The socialist or, or uh, the Socialist Workers' Party was against this structure, but the smallholders were against it. The Christian Democrats were against it, and part of the Democratic Forum as well was against it. The negotiating representatives of the forum and Antal, the first freely elected prime minister of this country, and, and uh, his negotiating team that included uh, the last genuine president of this republic, Laszlo Shoyom. Uh, uh, they, they were favorable to this design, so there was an agreement between the liberals and them, but there was no agreement between them and the other part of the party. So that was one of the reasons why, uh, uh, after 1990, it was not possible to sanction the existing constitution by the parliament, which comprised only parties which were party to the agreement as well. This is because this design did not come out of the agreement straightforward. Now, over the, uh, over the years, over about 15 years, uh, the parties which resisted to this constitutional structure, uh, well, went through a learning process, partly learning through elimination, some of the parties who were against, were eliminated from the parliament, smallholders, the Christian Democrats, who then returned as satellites of Fidesz. They are not an independent party. Actually, they are a club within Fidesz. Uh, uh, they have no uh, independent list. They don't run separately, and, and their popular support is not measurable. Uh, and the socialists themselves changed their heart. Uh, the last time they tried somehow to initiate something like a revision of the existing constitutional structure was in 2004, and then they abandoned it. And uh, now uh, they agree with uh, the constitutional structure. We have. So if there is such an agreement on the constitutional structure, why do I speak about constitutional crisis and constitutional disaster now as Fidesz is in a position to make constitution. Well, the reason is that there was, as I told you, another cause for the incapacity of uh, Hungary to give itself a final constitution based on general consensus. In order to have a working constitution you need two kinds of agreements. The parties should agree on the constitutional design itself. They should agree that they jointly approve of this particular constitutional design for the country. But second, they also should agree that they all are not just parties competing for power within the bounds of the Constitution, but partners in maintaining those bounds, constitutional partners in this sense, that they all represent equal members of the Republic. The social groups, the political groups, and opinion groups they represent are equal members of the Republic. Now, this agreement was not there and is not there up to this day on the Hungarian right. The Hungarian right started its new career in 1990, where it abandoned in 1944, when it led uh, uh, the country to a disaster that swept it away. Now. The reason of the responsibility for this is not just on the right. The responsibility is partly or perhaps mainly on the left. 
it is the responsibility of the communists who who eliminated the right from the political arena and then eliminated the political arena as well. <laughs> uh, and so they, uh, they didn't allow the right to go through a process of self-criticism. Now, the view of the right up until 1944 was that they are the natural leaders of this country. And the right resurrected in 1990 with this view. When they suffer an electoral defeat, they don't see it as a result of a temporary shift in majorities, which then will be reversed sometimes in the future for the, in the favor. The, uh, those groups on the right which mark the ideological character of right-wing politics in this country see this kind of defeat as usurpers coming to power. The best expression of this was given by the present prime minister in, nine, no, in 2002 after uh, Fidesz lost the elections. He told to his people in a mass demonstration, we will not be in opposition because the fatherland can never be in opposition. Now, uh, we will have a right genuinely accommodated with modern democracy when the leader of the right will tell someday to its people, we will be in opposition, but the fatherland will not be in opposition. The fatherland can never be in opposition, which means that the other side has the legitimacy to rule. Now, uh, it's a long story, and it's a complicated question, why the learning process concerning constitutionalism, which went on on the left, was not accompanied by a parallel learning process on the right. On the contrary, what we experienced in the last about five years since 2006, since the fall crisis of 2006, was a stiffening of the rights position. Uh, the right became more adamant than ever in its conviction that the other side is just as others. Now again, you may ask me whether the other side has its responsibility in this story. But in any case, or, or whether the full responsibility uh, lies with the right. But in any case, this is uh, where we are, and this is both a reason why, uh, one of the reasons why in the last 20 years Hungary could not solve its constitution-making problem, and or constitution-finalizing problem, and the reason why uh, the right now having a constitutional majority is a source of a constitutional crisis. We had a constitution, up to now, which was first the making of all the parties. Not all the parties identified with it, but all the parties in, in parliament were parties to designing this constitution, and therefore never over these 20 years, the constitution itself could be attacked as the other side's constitution. <coughs> there were symbolic attacks saying that this is the old communist constitution because it has the title uh, uh, law number 20 in 1949. That was the communist constitution. Uh, but uh, nobody could tell uh, that you socialists, or you Fidesz, or you Democratic Forum, you twisted this constitution to your favor. This is why now uh, uh, we are in such uh, an unfortunate position as your uh, opposition. But now the 
right decided that in order to resolve the constitutional stalemate, they should make a constitution which is Hungary's rights constitution. Now we will have a constitution which will be made by Fidesz and its satellite, the Christian Democrats, alone in a conversation with an extreme right party which will vote against, but the two parties to the left of Fidesz boycott the constitution making. But they boycott the constitution making for good reasons because, because the constitution is designed in such a way as first uh, express symbolically the identity of the nation with the traditional right. It identifies Hungarian statehood with the Holy Crown in its longish, longish preamble. It uh, uh, speaks about uh, Christianity as constitutive of the nation, and it speaks about the cultural nation informed by Christianity as the subject of constitution making, not the people as a political category, not the people as the totality of those subjected to the law, having therefore the right to have the law given to them by people delegated for this task by themselves, but members of, ethnic Hunga of the ethnic Hungarian nation, wherever they should live. And in conformity to this symbolic announcement, uh, they want to give massive voting rights to all Hungarians not living in Hungary, not living under Hungarian laws, who ask for Hungarian citizenship. So uh, a Hungarian in Transylvania, for example, who uh, uh, has no stakes in the law in Hungary, will have a say under this constitution on what uh, the law is in this country. Also, the catalog of basic rights the, this draft constitution provides for is a typically right-wing catalog. It twists the interpretation of basic rights or uh, in the sense of the traditionalist right. First of all, it combines rights with responsibilities and obligations. The modern understanding of basic rights is that we have our rights in virtue of our status, first as human persons and second as citizens, not in virtue of discharging responsibilities. Now, this constitution will, for example, provide for a right to work combined with the responsibility to work in order to enrich the nation. <laughs> uh, it provides for a right to private property with a proviso that private property involves unspecified responsibilities. Also, it introduces uh, uh, special right-wing agendas in the definition of particular rights. For example, it says uh, everyone has a right to life and human dignity, virgo, fetal life is to be protected from conception on. Now, they say no ban on abortion follows. I'm saying they will not have the courage to implement what is entailed by this sentence. Uh, also, the previous constitution uh, included a provision on protecting marriage and the family. They amend this provision uh, saying that marriage as a voluntary union of a man and a woman 
needs to be protected. But finally, and most importantly, in, importantly, they change the constitutional design in such a way as to dismantle the constitutional checks and balances on the present government. But the switch is such, if you want later on, I, I can explain it, how is it possible, that the present government uh, will be freed of the control of uh, the other branches of government. But the next majority will be lamed by it. Uh, not, uh, not just uh, under its normal effect, but actually lame. So that is the crux of the present constitutional crisis in Hungary. Now, you may have questions concerning the deta details I, of what I have said or questions regarding issues I did not discuss in my talk. I'm open to them so far as I'm able to answer them. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, we uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Keys. We have, we have a few minutes, probably about 10, 15 minutes, for someone to take up any one of those numerous themes that we have. Would you like to, would like to start us off? Comment or question or? Uh, I have just one remark, <clears throat> or perhaps it's rather a question. As far as I know, let, let me go back to the beginning of the story. As far as I remember, the opposition roundtable did not want to negotiate on the constitution, on the new constitution with the party state before uh, the elections. So this, uh, this was also a compromise uh, when they accepted, uh, 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 the, the communists wanted to have it. They pushed it. Uh, 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 they proposed a draft of, of a new constitution of democratic socialism. Uh, therefore, they uh, somehow implemented a kind of pressure on the process of roundtable negotiations. And that was the way how the opposition forces uh, accepted the view that, okay, let, me, let us agree upon some uh, constitutional clauses uh, as well. Uh, don't you think that uh, if, perhaps the first question is, is that true? Am I right? Uh, the second, uh, it may uh, uh, contribute it to the view on the other side, on the right, for example, that. Uh, that the main purpose of the communist uh, in order to push a constitution uh, through the roundtable negotiations before the uh, free elections was that they wanted to somehow secure their own legal and constitutional status uh, to, to, to somehow save it over to the regime change and, and create a kind of political legitimacy uh, for the rulers of the, of the, of the ancien regime. And that's why on the right uh, might had the impression uh, that uh, this whole constitutional framework, which was created by the, uh, by the regime change, by the process of the regime change, uh, served the survival of, uh, of the old communist into the, into the new regime, which is um, uh, quite a, a, a bad shadow on it. Now the fact is that uh, if, uh, the Communist Party asked the, justice, the Ministry of Justice to draft a new constitution and there was an agreement on, on uh, the outlines and the draft, when they engaged in uh, negotiations with the opposition, when the Central Committee of the Communist Party decided to uh, decided that that uh, the party has to engage in negotiations with uh, opposition groups and transition. They also decide. They also resolve that the 
constitution, that the drafting of the new constitution should be accelerated. That is, that was the expression in the published resolution of the Central Committee. And in fact, by the time uh, that it came to the negotiations, the draft was complete and it included everything I have spoken about, the corporatist upper chamber and, and uh, the president of the republic having executive powers and elected directly by, by, popular, by direct popular vote. Now, that's correct, but it is also true that the opposition made as a condition for engaging in negotiations that that draft is set aside, is being set aside. And in fact, the communists agreed. It was never uh, proposed either uh, to the round table to discuss or to the parliament to vote on. So it, it is not the case that, that constitutional amendments uh, have been adopted because the communists pushed for them. There were some they were pushing for, that's true. They were pushing for, uh, for their concept of the president. Now, now, the reason why the opposition agreed to discuss the issue of the presidency was that we had a presidential council before and we didn't want to have the presidential council after the election that, would, uh, that could have created a, a, a constitutionally incoherent situation, right? So, so there was negotiation on, on uh, uh, the president. But actually, that part of the round table, which was ready to make concessions to uh, uh, the communists on the presidency was the right wing part of the round table. Those who agreed with the idea, with the concept, smallholders and Christian Democrats, they were happy about having this. And uh, the Democratic Forum, which uh, believed the leaders of which those who represented the forum at the round table, Antal and company, believed that this is a necessary concession. I think that was a political mistake on their part, but, but uh, I think it was honorable. They, they really thought that if they don't uh, give the, this concession, there will be a stalemate, there will be no agreement. The whole thing, the whole process break, breaks down, and who knows whether uh, we will have time enough to com accomplish the transition before the Soviets come to their reason and intervene. Okay, so that was the story. And, and uh, the fact is that, that, when it came, that when it came to, uh, to discussions on, on, on constitutional amendments, uh, one simply could not stop. One simply could not stop because there was uh, this article in the Constitution that was to be amended. The, the, the article on the leading role of the party, of course, was to be amended. Then the article on political freedoms was to be amended, and so on and so forth. And in the end, we found ourselves with a completely changed constitution, except that it was the official view of everybody then, that no matter how good it is, it is a transition constitution, right? This is not the final one. We, 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 uh, so, uh, had, I think we have thought about it as later on, it was explicitly done, in South Africa, where they made a complete interim constitution, right, for the transition period. And then the freely elected parliament made the final constitution three or four years 
after. And that was our idea. OK, we've got the next question. Okay. Okay. Professor Kish, thank you very much for an interesting and uh, refreshing lecture refreshing for memory, individual and collective. And I have um, you know, one comment and one question. Uh, comment, I was a bit puzzled by this uh, statement of progressive um, erosion of legitimacy of the communist regimes, because it almost sounds like a case of Hungarian exceptionalism, because uh, after 1968, Czechoslovakia was completely illegitimate uh, regime. After 1981, Poland was considered a completely illegitimate communist regime. And I wonder whether we can um, separate these two variables, legitimacy and legality, whether actually ever since the Helsinki Accords, uh, um, there was a struggle within the legality for the substantive legality and the struggle that was taken up by dissidents for human rights, uh, constitutional rights, and permanent critique of the regime on the basis of its uh, illegal uh, um, actions. And uh, in this respect, when Gorbachev actually adopted the language of human rights, he adopted the language of his critics, and it was the beginning of the collapse of the regime and the beginning of uh, the revolution, so the, the international context of it. Uh, my question is, um, about the invisible constitution, uh, that was very, very strong concept in Hungary in 1990s. Whether this uh, uh, judicial activism of the constitutional court, uh, reading the invisible constitution, was it part, uh, in your view, was it part of uh, interim constitution making, or was it part of attempt, a genuine attempt at final constitutional settlement at the time? Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, thank you very much for your comment. And of course, uh, I agree on the point that the Hungarian story was in many ways different from the others. But I would want to make, nevertheless, uh, a defensive uh, uh, kind of uh, rejoinder to your comment. Uh, legitimacy in the sociological sense is a complex matter, uh, and and uh, uh, different social groups have different attitudes, may have different attitudes to it. And what I have in mind when I am saying, I am speaking about erosion of legitimacy, uh, at least this that uh, that uh, the apparatus of power must have the conviction that that their power is not does not rest on sheer force there is something more to it in order for them to be able to continue for long. And that kind of belief, I think, was eroded only as a process, uh, it, uh, even in those countries where, where uh, the popular strata denied legitimacy to uh, the regime and considered it just as an illegitimate oppressed uh, a bunch of people uh, sitting on Soviet bayonets. Okay. But I agree that I, I agree that, that Hungary was different in this respect in that that the uh, a kind of surrogate popular legitimacy was awarded to to uh, uh, the uh, government up until the last years of the nineteen 80s and since the mid 1960s on the basis of a belief that under the Soviets, this is the best we can have. Now, on the invisible constitution, uh, well, for those who may not know what the invisible constitution is, the first president of the constitutional court 
and the last, for the time being, genuine president of this republic. Uh, in 1990, in, in a concurring opinion, uh, he has written to, uh, to uh, the death penalty decision of the court, uh, has written about uh, an invisible constitution as the background moral principles uh, uh, in terms of which the constitutional text is to be interpreted. And he claimed that it is the task of the court to uncover to make visible what is behind the written constitution, what is invisible behind the written constitution. Now, his idea, the idea of the then court, and, the, 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 and then progressively, the general view in this country was that this is not the interpretation of a provisional constitution. First of all, he believed that that, that interpretation uh, remains somehow. It is, it it, it uh, explains the basics of constitutionalism, so that if ever we have a constitution which satisfies the conditions of constitutionalism, it satisfies the requirements of the invisible constitution. But also, he believed that this is a final constitution which will finalize itself in. Uh, eight years ago, I had a public debate with him on this. He said there is no need for finalizing the Constitution. It finalizes itself. I said, no, 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 we are going to have trouble. Okay, we've got time. Two more questions, one here and one over there, and then we're going to have to call it. Oh, uh, Janos, I'm fascinated by your paradox of power uh, that you cited early on, the power, the, the relative weakness of the Hungarian opposition uh, and those who were coming to the regime to try to get change in comparison, as you said, with the relative strength of the, the opposition and the solidarity groups in, in Poland. Um, but what about the, the I mean, it was necessary for this uh, assertion of uh, great uh, extreme positions, as you might have stated, in order to gain popular acceptance because the groups that were pushing forward uh, were <coughs> unknown in the Hungarian public, and therefore, they, in order to gain some public acceptance, they had to take strong positions. But what about the impact of external circumstances? I, I don't think that I, I've heard you speak much about that. After all, the, the whole tapestry of this region is, and political uh, arrangements are changing very rapidly. Um, so I assume that the opposition, of which you were a part, was taking that into account. And how would you weigh that as one of the major factors that led to uh, your ability to take these rather strong positions yeah. as you outline them? Well, the fact is that, that I think uh, there were two main moderating factors which, which concurred and which were different from what I have spoken so far. One was that uh, only the communists knew that uh, the Politburo of the Soviet Communist Party in, in March 1989 took a decision not to intervene in any case in Poland or in other East European countries. They informed as we later learned the Hungarian communist leadership. That decision was taken when, when uh, the Polish government started negotiating with Solidarność and they asked for a permission. And, they, and, and that issue was discussed in the Politburo and the decision was taken and communicated. 
So the communist leaders in Hungary knew about that. We didn't know about that. And, and uh, uh, therefore, the presence of the Soviet Union and the memories of 56, 68, and 81 were indeed restraining factors. I think all over the region, but in Hungary I know they were. And when I was saying that, that the Democratic Forum's delegation at the opposition roundtable and the national roundtable misread the political situation, I have this in mind. So they, I, I think they, the deal they struck was an, honor, an honorable one, mistaken but honorable one, as it was proved by uh, the referendum and the non-reaction on the part of the Soviets to it. And the other factor was uh, the West. Uh, uh, we, were said, we were told by all the ambassadors and all the foreign ministers who came here and prime ministers and whoever, caution, caution. Caution because the Soviets will intervene. So they wanted uh, to maintain the status quo they, uh, and therefore they they tried to temper the, the movement in the region uh, so far as they could. And I, I, I think that although they, they also misread the situation, that was not unhelpful because I am convinced to these times that the fact that transition was orderly and peaceful was an enormous victory and, and something we will draw upon in later crisis. Uh, but never, uh, so, so this is again a case where uh, one, ha one makes fruitful mistakes, helpful mistakes. Okay, we have just the last question up here, then we must go. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, actually, two quick ones. One is that uh, people talk about the, the chances of civil disobedience uh, against the Constitution if it's pushed through. And in connection with that, I wonder that to what extent you think the population, the society is poisoned with the idea of the exclusive constitutionalism, what you described, that the right-wing leaders are pushing this idea that they are the country. If they lead the country, that's fine. If not, then the country okay. is kind of occupied. Okay. And the other short question is that to what extent you think they are going to write uh, to rewrite the invisible constitution. So those sort of landmark decisions, for example, about freedom of speech and independent of independence of media regulatory agencies, that that is laid down by decisions of the constitutional court based on the 89 constitution. Now, well, both questions are hard questions in, in a very special way. Namely, uh, you asked me to make forecasts, and, and uh, uh, as, as others, I don't have a crystal ball. So I can uh, give you only my guess. And uh, insofar as my guess about the f concerning the first question is concerned, how much people are, as you put it, poisoned by this idea of the right-wing exceptionalism. My answer is that, my tentative answer would be that the reason why Fidesz has constitutional majority is not to be sought in, in uh, an agreement in a wide agreement with the view of Fidesz leadership and the intelligentsia around them of the Hungarian nation and, and the right as the natural embodiment, besides, of course, the Holy Crown of the nation. Uh, 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 it, is, it is more a reaction uh, to uh, 
the left and I am sorry to say the liberals compromising themselves uh, over the past eight years. And very interestingly, now the, the general support for the government is for the first time dramatically shrinking from one month to the other. They lost about seven to eight percent in one month. But even before, even before, you could see that there is a gap between the support for the government and the support or opinions for its policies, right? Uh, that gap was not there at the beginning, but it is there since the fall. So the media law or the curtailing of the powers of the constitutional court or even constitution making have no majority support. Okay. So that is that is one point where I think we can give some reason for hope. Now, uh, insofar the other question is concerned, I think the main issue uh, is not whether they will try to rewrite the invisible constitution. They do it. They, they did it already over these uh, nine months. And in many of the uh, legislative measures, uh, including the media law, the, the, the main question is whether they succeed to tame the constitutional court, or they don't. And the danger is that first, they succeed. And second, that they will have a court uh, packed not in the Roosevelt sense uh, by their own uh, confidantes, not independent justices, but, but clients of uh, the present prime minister, and third, that they crea create a design where uh, neither citizens nor uh, members of parliaments individually can appeal to the court, can file a petition to the court uh, ac according to the d draft constitution, only 25% of the members of parliament together can file a petition with the court. Now, uh, there are other provisions concerning percentages in parliament. For example, provision on proposing a president or proposing to remove the president or, or uh, filing a, a proposal of non-confidence. That requires 20%. Here, 25% are required. Why? Because the democratic opposition parties don't have 25% by themselves alone. Only with Jobbik, the extreme right party. And it is hard to see how they can agree on an appeal to the constitutional Court and also how a democratic party can allow itself to make common cause with the extreme right against the government. So the danger is the constitutional court will not be in a position to consider any of the revisions of the invisible constitutions to come because only the government will be in a position to file a petition to the court, and guess when a government asks the court to test a law it already passed for its constitutionality. So that's probably a, a very suitable point on which to conclude. Uh, Janos, uh, thank you for your splendid lecture. Uh, it's, it's such a pleasure to, to listen to someone who is so involved in the details, both of the creation of constitutions 
and in studying the way that they've developed and unfolded. So thank you very much indeed, both for your lecture and for your very perceptive answers to these questions. Thank you. Thank you very much.